Uh, hello, this is Mark Wildman of Wildman Athletica, and today we are going to be working on answering some questions. Uh, it's been a while since we've uh, done one of these radio broadcast lives, and that is my fault, technical issues, trying to figure everything out. And uh, so let's uh, pull up some current questions until we get some people coming in and start with some answering. Uh, anybody has any questions, feel free to type them in and send them over to me, and we will get going on those questions just right away. One moment here. Let's see what we got going. Uh, here's a fun question. Uh, if you were trapped on a desert island and you had to pick a kettlebell a club or a mace, what would you pick? And that is always an interesting question. And the question is, uh, for me, what else is on that island? For the most part, I got to say it, I would pick a mace. Uh, that's a bit of a controversial opinion. Uh, if you're trapped on a desert island, you would be working for your survival every day. And therefore, I don't think you would really need a kettlebell because you would spend most of your time picking up heavy objects and moving them around on their own but you would like something that's more therapeutic in nature, both mentally and physically, and intermediate weights uh, with high complexity would be something you could just keep doing forever. Uh, if you were trapped on a desert island, you would have no timers. You would have nothing like that, and you would just be stuck to your own devices. So uh, kettlebells, yeah, fun, but it would have to be an intermediate to low weight kettlebell, but I think levers are probably more entertaining to operate for longer periods of time. And so, yeah, I would pick mace. I would pick a, you know, 12.5 pound mace or something like that for if you were trapped on a desert island. Uh, let's start answering some of these other questions. How do you cure flat feet? You cure flat feet by pointing your feet straight ahead and doing exercises that cause the arches of your feet to fire, and then you keep doing them for thousands upon thousands upon thousands of reps. It's intermediate weight swinging at uh, high rep with good technique. If you have crap technique, then it doesn't work at all. Um, you have to be pretty particular about how you do certain exercises, and that's why most people have coaches at some point but to help people see things that they can't see in themselves when they're reviewing themselves. You know, I have coaches, I've had aerial coaches, kettlebell coaches, club coaches, and mace coaches, and the CrossFit coaches, and martial arts coaches. Uh, you're always looking for coaches because coaches are the people who can basically see things that you can't see yourself. They can see when you're not straightening out your leg. They can see if you're driving from one hip instead of the other, if you're pressing out of phase or anything like that over time if you've had lots of coaches you get pretty good at understanding what all of those things are that's why you're constantly shifting back and forth between different types of coaching so i go to say when the world is functioning train with stunt guys and those stunt guys tell you things about training for the movie industry that are very important basically secret knowledge and you go and you train with crossfit guys because even though I am not the biggest fan of CrossFit. I am a huge, huge fan of CrossFit. And I am constantly looking at those guys and seeing what those guys do. Because those guys are the fittest in the world. The question is, is are they fit the way that I want to be fit? And you always need an aerial coach if you're going to be doing something like aerial. Because aerial is super complicated and very life-threatening. So it always helps to have somebody there who is... Uh, capable of helping you and explaining things to you and making sure you don't mess up grips or put a hand upside down or do something like that that's going to accidentally get you killed. So coaching is always the most important thing, uh, but you can, flix, you can fix flat feet on your own and on your own time. You just have to have a lot of information and a very thorough plan. Question from Casey Krupa. You ever try using Bulgarian bags? Uh, yes, I've used some classic leather Bulgarian bags. Um, I find them entertaining, uh, but I'm not sure that Bulgarian bags do anything that, say, clubs uh, don't do a little bit better. They do have some slightly different positions, and I think Bulgarian bags 
are absolutely excellent for people who are closer into the grappling world because a lot of the positions in Bulgarian bag are kind of compromised positions. And I find that grappling has a lot of those weird compromised positions in them. So I like Bulgarian bag, but I kind of like the hydro core more because it's essentially a light to intermediate Bulgarian bag that you can make into something very, very light to take with you. I travel a lot, so I like that version of it. Uh, I could not carry in in the hierarchy of things that are valuable to, uh, with in the hierarchy of things that are valuable for me to travel with. Bulgarian bags are extremely low on the list. Uh, normally, when I travel overseas for large projects, I buy kettlebells when I'm there because it's not usually worth it to. Um, ship them because of the large amount of weight. You know, you could easily ship a thousand pounds of kettlebells if you were to work on a project overseas for six months. It's usually easier just to order them in whatever country you're in and deal with what you got. What I do take along is kettlebells, or what I do take along is club bells quite a bit because clubs are very rare. You're not going to find them most places, and if you do, it's going to be a long wait time. Because clubs are also of a light weight, you can drag them around with you in hard cases. You can put them on planes. If you do all your math right and you calculate it and you pay a little bit of overage, that's worth it. And I travel with maces as well because those things can be relatively light. And you can take a 10, a 15, and a 20-pound mace and put it in a 7-pound container and probably check it on with you uh, most airlines, although the um, weight is dropping on airlines. But if you're flying at a slightly higher class or you play, pay for heavier bags, then you can take that stuff with you and have it immediately available to you. Bulgarian bags are just a little bit heavy. They're as heavy as kettlebells are for a lot of them, 30 pound, 40 pound, 50 pound bags. And those things are a little bit harder to take along with you. It's harder to justify taking them. But carrying hydro cores, I happily throw two hydro cores in my bag in the future moving on in order to get uh, that same type of load. Uh, what exercise would you do to fix plantar fasciitis? Well, it would be all the stuff you do to fix flat feet and a lot of rolling of your arches with spiky balls. 1.5 inch to 2.5 inch balls, rolling them, rolling the arches of your feet for extended periods of time and stretching the crap out of your Achilles. Um, you'd probably do 10 minutes of that a day stand on a ball, a spiky ball for two minutes and roll it for two minutes, go back and forth, do it twice. That's easily eight minutes right there. And then do a hardcore calf stretch for two minutes on each side would put you at 12 minutes and then do your rhythmic weight swinging. Plantar fasciitis is usually a lot of things just not quite interacting in your feet super well. Um, you know, or you could just walk around barefoot on stone for a long time and it would solve a lot of its own problem. But most people aren't going to put up with that level of discomfort in order to do it. Next question. How do you program heavy clubs along with kettlebell dumbbell workout rep wise? Uh, heavy clubs. There are two strategies for training heavy clubs that I have. I have a single arm strategy, which is done by reps volume cycles. And I have a two handed strategy, which is done as a time under tension strategy. Uh, and then the time under tension strategy is a two-handed strategy. And that one, you set up a series of exercises. You run the program for a specific amount of time. You count your reps and you see if you're getting faster or slower. And then you run it against weight. And it's a simple strategy, but that's the most effective strategy that I've seen for using clubs. Because clubs are light to intermediate weights. I have seen some guys start making really, really heavy clubs, which would be able to be applied to like pure strength pro programs, but they're just not readily available. And most people aren't going to go buy a hundred pound club because they would rip themselves in half if they haven't done all of the work to get up to the heavier weights. Mm. How would you train MMA using biomechanics or what would you specify your training around? Uh, yeah, biomechanics. If you were trained for MMA, it would be kettlebells, clubs, hydrocore, mace, and sandbag. And it would be probably time under tension programs. It would depend on what 
the uh, athlete's previous training strategy was. So if they were a judo guy, it would be one thing. If they were like a grappler, it would be a different thing. If they were a boxer, it would be another thing. That's a pretty deep and big question uh, to train for MMA. But for the most part, it would be your nerd math basic strategy in order to make sure that your, your fundamentals are really, really good. And then you would design MMA Metcons using kettlebells, clubs, sandbags, etc., in order to get even closer to the activities that you need to be good at. So your basic strength training pretty much stays the same, and you would do strength training program for two-hand heavy clubs for, and one for kettlebells, which is your nerd math. And then your Metcons are completely determined on how strong you are after all of that and what you're going to live through. And you can write a thousand MMA programs off the top of your head based on what types of movements that they know that they're going to need to do. But there would be a lot of low shin box uh, movements in there and shin box presses and things of that nature because I find that shin box is a really good movement to be really, really good at if you're going to be involved in MMA and grappling. Uh, and of course, lots of spinal rock series, spinal rock into plow series to keep you from getting stacked up on. I always see people have deficiencies in their spinal rock and that keep that, that allows them to get stacked up really easily. And that's usually a problem for a lot of people when it comes to MMA type training. Uh, uh, from Taylor, what's been your favorite movie to train and work on and why? Uh, favorite movie that I trained on? I'm going to say Wonder Woman 2. That was a great shoot. That shoot was in, started in D.C. And we had availability of basically like kind of like a private small CrossFit gym. And we had our heavy clubs and kettlebells. And there was a, a great section there where we got to train in D.C. for, I can't remember what it was. It's got to be at least five weeks. And it was the beginning of that movie, so we were getting to do two-a-days, train in the morning really early, like 4 a.m., and do wake-up program and complexity club stuff. And then in the afternoon, come back and do kettlebells mixed with Concept 2 machines. They had both ski ergs and rowers that was really fun and then moving on from that we went into travel sections of training to london to vancouver and during all those small travel sections we were traveling with clubs and maces and then we did a section in uh spanish isles which was primarily done mostly with mace uh that was a really interesting a movie to train on because there were so many locations and so many requirements on travel that it became very interesting way to have to design your programs on all those things. And the last section was at Warner Brothers in the UK, and they had just an absolutely awesome training facility. Um, it was brutal because you were up at 3 a.m. every day, so your first workout was after travel and everything started at like 4 30 or 5 a.m and then we got down to one workout one long workout a day that was anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour and a half but i like training on movies like that because you get an exact time when you arrive on set and so you have to have your tetris of training really well dialed in in order to make sure you're meeting the time requirements because as a trainer you don't get to tell anybody else what the time frame is Everybody else gets to tell you what the time frame is, and your job is to respond to that within seconds and come up with a new plan on the fly, which is a super fun thing to do. Uh, another great movie to train on was Outlaw King because that was all for sword fighting in armor and chain mail. So there got to be super amounts of fun training on that one. The pre-training for that was lots of stacking up heavy clubs after discussing with the actor and the actor wanting to know, like, would they be doing barbell back then? And the answer is definitely not. But they would probably be doing stuff very closely related to sandbagging clubs. Knights training in the year 1290 certainly wouldn't be doing any type of barbell. But they would be doing lots of loaded carries, 
lots and lots of complex fight training and they would be doing all of it under load with armor. That was a fun program to write and a fun program to work on because every day on that movie we were shifting locations. There was no base studio location. So it just changed around all the time. And we had like a little training trailer, which is kind of like a semi trailer and it would be drug around every time they moved set locations, which was, I think there were 60 location moves or 60 locations on that movie, but there were more location moves because we were going back and forth between different locations based on availability. But we rocked all the way up into 60 pound clubs on that movie. We custom made some heavy clubs for the 50, 55 and 60 pound range. Night FX in LA helped us with those custom clubs, helped us make those exactly to our standards. And it was, that was a, great awesome movie to train on super fun and rocked really heavy 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 club program for that one uh question from ryan do i ever lift for strength uh using barbells do i feel they are too costly in terms of central fatigue i do use barbells when i go to crossfit uh my buddy runs a crossfit gym here in la he's a world-class competitive uh, ultraman triathlete and he runs a gym and so he does a lot of um ed- like endurance load crossfit but all that involves barbells i'm not great at barbells i just have way too many injuries and too many surgeries asymmetric load is actually better for me than symmetrical load symmetrical load when one side of your body because it's been if repeatedly injured and cut apart in surgery starts to fail, you start to push all that load to the other side and it stacks up and can cause a lot more fatigue injuries than I think are necessary. I like barbells. I think that they're a super valuable tool and obviously they've changed the way that mankind has become strong from say traditional forms of training like uh, Persian wrestler training with that was all heavy clubs and you know rolling shield presses and all these things like that barbell allowed humanity to reach kind of a new level of very precise scientific based strength training but i do feel like it has some weaknesses uh do i love barbells yes do i do them a lot no i have a barbell in my studio but i don't have a rack um and i don't teach a lot of barbells to people because for the most part people don't have barbells and racks at home for the most part you can get a lot of kettlebells and a lot of clubs for the same amount of money as, you know, a rogue Ohio bar, last time I checked, was 400 bucks plus, you know, you need at least 400 pounds of plates. You know, that's running you a lot of money. Think about that as a dollar per weight if you get it super duper cheap, but it's more at the range of like $1.25. So that's another $500 just in plates. And now to have a rogue rack, a self-standing rogue rack is what? you know, at least a thousand dollars. So you're in for $2,000. If you want a barbell at home, if you go to a CrossFit gym, they have all that stuff Then definitely go to a CrossFit gym and barbell. I like barbelling. It's just not the most useful for somebody who travels as much as I do, but there's nothing wrong with it. If you were to combine barbell with club or combine barbell with kettlebell or combine barbell with mace, If you combined a barbell with any one of those other things, the program would work itself out and you fill most of the holes from each type of training with the other one. So I'm always a huge fan of that. If you barbell, then mace, you know, that would add up very quickly to an extremely, extremely good program. Do I do webcam coaching? No, but I'm thinking about it. It's just webcam coaching is a little bit hard because I like to be able to walk around people to see what's happening from another angle. Something that you can't see from the front, like somebody's right leg not extending all the way. You have to be able to walk to the side to see. Uh, But we're going to consider it moving forward. What is something fun that I'm working on in my own practice? Uh, Supermoto. (laughs) Which is not something that's specifically related to fitness training, but it is to me. Uh, I think that supermoto guys and motocross guys have an insane endurance ability. Guys who are standing off the pegs on a dirt bike doing 70 over jumps and just absorbing force nonstop is uh, a sport that I think is really fascinating right now. And 
I've been training more of it since hanging out with a certain couple of stunt guys. And they were like, you really should learn this. It'd be really good for you. And it will open your eyes to new types of training. And so I've been doing that quite a bit lately. Um, so I'm considering that super fun and it is beating the crap out of me, which is why I haven't finished a lot of the stuff that's been on my list to do is because when you mess up dirt biking, the cost is pretty high. It's kind of like, it's not quite as bad as messing up in circus training, but it's, it's pretty bad when you mess up and you biff it really hard through a tree or something that does beat you up quite a bit. Uh, best kettlebell workouts for lean mass. That is a huge question. There's a thousand answers to that question. Uh, depends on, well, there's about seven variables there I could, would consider. Uh, think about uh, unending combinations with three formats, probably EMOM, nonstop, and rotating rounds with intermediate 16 to 24K and different programs every day. Those are really, really easy programs to write. They're really, really hard programs to explain without like a three-hour seminar. But I have a whole computer full of those things. I just need to be able to get it out to you guys somehow. Recommend a sandbag, damn it. Uh, okay. Uh, the Onnit sandbag is great. It goes up to 70 pounds. For most people, that's plenty. Most people aren't really going to be rocking. If they're running other types of programs as well, if they're also running a kettlebell program or a club program, then up to a 70-pound sandbag is pretty good for most people. If you're going to be a professional athlete, then you're going to want to go higher than that. Then you're going to want a brute force sandbag. The athlete bag, I think, goes up to 125 pounds. Uh, I have one of those. I had two of them, but I gave one to my firefighter buddy because his uh, gym is closed. Uh, those are also great bags. The Onnit bags and the Brute Force bags, I haven't had any trouble with either of those bags. The old, was it, DVRT bag, I bought one of those things. It was super expensive, and it was absolute crap. It failed on the first day. I was so generally unhappy with that product that I would never tell anybody to get one of those bags at all. Uh, the Brute Force bags are super solid. The Onnit bags, I haven't busted them at all, and I've had the Onnit bags for like three or four years now. Simple and sinister, good or bad? Uh, good. Simple and sinister is a great program. I don't know how you could think it was bad. It's simple. For the most part, most people need very simple, very effective programs, and it's a very simply designed program that will solve a massive amount of people's athletic problems. Uh, Turkish get-ups are fantastic exercise. I like to complicate Turkish get-ups over time, but Simple and Sinister is a brilliant plan. And if you were to take complicated Turkish get-ups, I have a bunch of those breakdowns on my channel. That would be great. Oh, I'm going to sneeze here. Hold on. Got off, just got off the dirt bike. Oh, ah, no, I think I pushed it down. Um, a Turkish get-up with a 16K is impossible for you. Then you need to find yourself a 12 or start doing all of our Turkish get up breakdown movements. We have a whole playlist of them on YouTube and you need to start filling in all the holes by making the Turkish get up simpler. The Turkish get up is kind of our target exercise. And then we, if you can't do it, then we break it down in smaller pieces. And if you can do it and your weight is too light, then we add pieces to it. Simple strategy totally works. Uh, the, what we're always trying to do is get more out of each weight that we have. Uh, I touched on shin box get-ups for BJJ athletes previously. What other movement patterns with kettlebells, clubs, etc. would you consider that are different from the big five? That's a question from Mark Stokes. Um, for BJJ, you're really looking at a lot of body flow. You're going to want to focus on your shin box and then your shin box series leading into uh, like a walking pigeon series. If anybody, if you guys know what that is, I don't have any videos on that right now. Uh, but shin box, because of the constant low back roll, 
shin box rolling get-ups are super important. And your spinal rock series, I could not emphasize this enough, is massively important. Most guys get into positions that I've seen. I haven't done, I haven't been to a BJJ school in like 10 years, but I still hang out with a lot of BJJ guys. And a lot of stunt guys do a lot of BJJ because it's a foundational thing that they want to have in their program for being able to move forward in a lot of different types of movies, fight scenes, round work, um, spinal rock series and shin box series. Shin box series is related to our four count series, uh, four count get downs into shin box with no hands. If you have that mobility in spinal rock series, you're going to be doing pretty well because it's going to be hard for a lot of people to uh, jam you up very easily. Uh, yeah, I'll just have to make it. 50 videos on that at some point. Uh, can you run mace and steel clubs in the same cycle? Yes, you can. I run light mace programs and heavy club programs. You could do it the other way too, and you could run heavy mace programs and light club programs, but I find that that doesn't have the diversity of movement that I like as much. Most people... Because steel clubs are much, much heavier for the most part, I do full, like a fundamental seven movement uh, program with steel clubs. And I use maze for high levels of complexity and unending load. So I do run those two things in the same cycles, but they, you're going to want to have done one of them individually first. If you try and do both of them right off the bat, you might start having elbow or shoulder trouble because it might be a lot of load for the tendons and ligaments in your elbow if you haven't already adapted to some type of loaded weight swinging rotation. Can you describe a cheerleading tip in here? Man, cheerleading tip. Yes, cheerleading tip. Maybe I'll try and make that video later today. Uh, base or flyers, real question. Zer Dante, uh, if you can follow up that question, uh, base or flyer for base, it's an upright row to a catch to a squat to an overhead press. There are four versions of that movement immediately. Set the kettlebell on the ground, point both feet straight ahead. Think about it as your bottom of your um, base position, two bases stack up next to each other opposite of each other they do their quad hand interlock so that your flyer can step in with one foot one two down up launch them up think about that and then they get to their catching position where they catch the foot uh and you have your athlete then stand at the top that would be an upright row to a catch and then i would also then go beyond that and load it to a window up goblet squat to a stand to a press because that's kind of all your, your base movements for cheerleading, your flyers would be doing rack position, kettlebell squats to a single leg stand, which is kind of their single leg post pose at the top. Um, maybe I'll call my, I have a cheerleader friend and I'll see if I can't drag him in here to, so we can do a video on that one, have it make more sense with having an actual cheerleader in the gym. A uh, question from George Juarez. So maybe that's Jorge Juarez. Is there a significant difference between sport kettlebell and hard style kettlebell and the techniques of both styles? Yes, there is massive difference. Hard style is more of what I have on my channel. Hard style is a single dip hip movement, which is designed for power. Uh, sport kettlebell is a double hip movement, which is designed specifically for efficiency. And they are two very different types of things. They're using the same implement, but in very, very different ways. In hard style, you move the kettlebell around your body and you make your body as straight up and down as possible. Sometimes you'll notice when I do kettlebell technique, I start to wrap my body around the bell. And that's from old school soft style training. I haven't done soft style training in years, but you know, it's still in there in the back of your head floating around. Uh, soft style, you wrap your body around the bell. You try to move the bell in as close to a straight line on your jerk as possible. And you move your body forward and back under the bell. Very much like a wrappy version of barbell techniques. They're not 
the same, but philosophically they're kind of the same, where the barbell wants to travel up and down in a straight line and you want to move around it. Same thing is true for soft style, for the top half of soft style, from rack position up. And for the lower half, they're trying to make it as easy as possible. So it's not a single dip like a hard style swing or clean. It's a double dip in order to make the bells weightless at the back bottom lowest part of the movement. So you can come out of load for a split second and then move through it. Am I explaining that correctly? I think I am. Um, yes, but hard style and soft style are very, very different. Soft style tends to focus more like Olympic lifting on their fundamental lifts. They just want to get really, really, really good at it. And the program is not super hard to understand, but it is super hard to understand if you're not great with math. Um, hard style has just a ton of different strategies. And hard style tends to deal more with higher levels of complexity and combining movements together in unpredictable ways to create new training responses. So think about soft style. You're trying to, get, trying to do things the same way every time so you can force more efficiency. And hard style, we want to get to a specific level of efficiency and then complicate it so that you're, getting, you're adapting to what I call broken rhythm, different types of heart load for different amounts of time and different movements all the time. I'm not sure if that made sense, but it made sense to me. Uh, Diego, will you continue to post videos on programming? Yes, I just haven't done it in a while, but they are, you know, will be a lot more coming. Uh, Vivek, any plans on creating a kettlebell training program for your website that we can buy? Thank you. Yes, there are at least seven of them written in my computer right now. And after I get done with this, I'm going to do a test edit to see <clears throat> if I can assemble this thing the way that I want to. I'm just, I keep running up against my ability to edit effectively. <laughs> and seeing as how there are no uh, editing schools open right now that I could go to to perfect my editing. It's taking me a lot longer than I thought. Uh, I plan to be going up to my friend's gym in September and I'm going to sit there at their gym and edit with them because they know a lot more about this than I do for two to three weeks and hammer out seven programs in a short period of time. Um, I lost some of my tech support here in LA because of the uh, <clears throat> enthusiastic protesting. Several people have left town, and that has curtailed my ability to get these projects done. Uh, but I am thinking about doing a subscription-based service because right now I'm doing some actual pretty fun, more advanced training with uh, a client. Uh, because the movie industry is basically non-existent right now, one of my clients is doing their own essentially micro budget film project coming up and we just started training for it. And I think it might be a really fun idea to do a subscription service based on that where we can go through every day and talk about training and it would be a longer training vid every day, like 30 minutes to 45 minutes where we explain the program, explain the design, explain the exercises and do that. So I'm thinking about doing that as a subscription based service because I think that that's actually fairly simple to edit every day and get out. Um, everybody let me know what you think about that idea. Would you guys like to see a subscription-based service to put out these uh, movie training things? Because uh, this, this program that she's doing is going to run through August, September, October, and then all the way through November, taking it all the way up pretty close to Christmas, I think. Uh, but that would be a good a super good advanced look at training. And as clients come back in or floating in and out, we'll talk about their training programs as well. So I think I might do that and I might try to get that up next week and just start that going and then leave the bigger nerd math videos until September when I can actually get the technical support I need for that. Uh, Sirvam Sivaram. 
Uh, any exercise suggestions for people with knee cartilage issues? Yeah, I have lots of knee cartilage issues. My entire channel. My entire channel is for people with knee cartilage issues <laughs> and people with knee issues in general. Um, for the most part, you're going to want to take a lot of your impact out. And the question is, what type of knee cartilage issues do you have? Have you worn away your knee cartilage? Have you split it and had it sewn back together? Um, you're going to take out most of your impact training. You'll notice I don't have a treadmill in my gym. I do treadmill and run when I'm on movies, but when I'm off movies, I've only got so much cartilage left in my legs from years of accidents and multiple knee surgeries. So I don't do a lot of heavy, high impact stuff if I can help it. I would like to save my impact for judo. So I do most of my cardio with rowing or ski erg or versa climber, all of which have the impact taken out, but still have lots of knee movement in them, which is still going to create degradation over time, but it's going to create less degradation over time. I do do box jumps and such when I go to CrossFit, but if I can replace a lots of running with rowing or ski erg and CrossFit, then I do. Replace your 400 meter run with your 500 meter row, things like that. That's a great option. Uh, all of I'm very, very particular on my channel about foot position, and that is because of knee position. Knee position has to be good if you want to live a long time, especially if you've already screwed your knees up a lot. Uh, do I recommend one big training session or spread your workouts out over a day? Um, both, uh, I do, I can write hour and a half long programs or I write smaller programs based on what we need. So on movies, if we have more time, then we will do a two a day just because that allows people more time to recover and allows them to have a better metabolic training effect. So if people are say have metabolic problems, if they are bigger than they want to be, then we would like to do more small workouts during the day. If you're already at a target weight and you need to get things done, then I recommend just getting it all done at once and having a maximum amount of recovery before tomorrow. So it can be either or. But if you can do two shorter workouts a day, I think that that's an excellent option. If you're at home and that's what you have, then yes, do, you can do your swings in the morning and do your Turkish get-ups at night. Do your clean and press at one time. Do your squats at another time keep kicking that metabolism up and down all throughout the rate of the, over the course of the day in order to get a over better overall metabolic training effect <clears throat> how would you incorporate clubs and kettlebells into crossfit uh, for the most part kettlebells are used in crossfit just as swings hard style swings or american swings um i would skip the American swings and just learn to do snatches anytime they had an American swing in there. If you're not a competitive CrossFit athlete, I don't see any point in doing American swings because the, ch ability, the chance of you messing up an American swing are super high. Unless you are a gymnast or a dancer, I would probably recommend people stay generally away from American swings because you have to have an Absolutely fantastic ability to not have your psoas um, come under too much load, which means you have to be really, really, really good at hollow position while hanging from a bar. That would be the prep for an American swing. Anytime there's something like an American swing, I would replace it with a Russian kettlebell swings, so shoulder height, hard style swings. Or I would replace it with snatches. And I do that occasionally at CrossFit, and it drives one of my CrossFit coaches crazy. My other CrossFit coach loves it. Um, and if you wanted to get even fancier than that, you could replace a lot of your barbell with kettlebell. And there are 80 ways to do that. Your double kettlebell basics. So instead of doing, you know, if you had to do, say, in your workout, you had hang power cleans with a barbell, and then you had chase it with barbell thrusters. I would probably do the hang power cleans with a barbell because that's a great exercise. But I would do the, kettle, do the thrusters with kettlebells if at all possible. Um, and you can do that for almost all that stuff. Uh, incorporating clubs is a little bit harder because, for the most part, 
clubs don't have a lot of direct translations to the stuff that they're doing. You could do, say, instead of wall balls to squat to front press with a club, which would be an absolutely savage, very mean thing to do. The difference is with clubs, clubs will regulate your speed for you because you can't accelerate so fast that you accelerate the handle faster than you accelerate the tip. Otherwise, you will end up in, with a lot of leverage problems and you will just fail the reps. Um, whereas med ball, you can accelerate a lot faster. Med ball is a lot more forgiving because it's not a lever. There's a lot of ways to do it less correct uh, than clubs. Clubs, you kind of have to do them pretty correct. Otherwise, they're going to just absolutely eat your face off. Um, but yeah, for the most part, you can replace most of the barbell stuff with kettlebells. You can replace a lot of, you know, med ball slams. Although I haven't seen a lot of med ball slams in CrossFit programming recently. They've mostly gone over to wall balls because wall balls are a lot uh, more interesting, I think, for the visual aspect of the games. But that's just an opinion. But you could also replace that with a pullover squat uh, pretty simply. Um, I really love the idea of CrossFit, but as the games get bigger and bigger, they've kind of gotten rid of a lot of the other weirder exercises and gone more to focusing on the test. You know, they're prepping for the test itself, uh, and have kind of left out kind of, they seem, they seem to be moving away from some of the more interesting stuff from back in like the 09, 010 era. Is it true that a person can clean and press for the only strength exercise and not develop problems over years of only doing clean and press? Good question. I don't know. I think that uh, kettlebell clean and press is probably the best, safest, long-term version of the clean and press. I think long-term, it's probably way better for you than barbell just because it can be asymmetric. Um, and you can load one side and then the other. You can do so much variation with kettlebell clean and press. I can think of 30 versions of kettlebell clean and press off the top of my head. Single arm kettlebell clean and press. Double kettlebell clean and press. Asymmetric kettlebell clean and press. Asymmetric low, asymmetric medium, asymmetric high. And there are two versions of each of those. Uh, start changing the rep counts in the middle. You know, two cleans, one press. Two, one clean, two presses. There's so many ways to vary the kettlebell clean and press that I think that you could probably keep it going for your entire life. But I haven't lived my entire life, but I'm pretty sure you can do it. There's nothing in the kettlebell clean and press, which I, I, I don't know where it could overtrain something so much that it causes your tendons or your ligaments to fail. It might be possible, but, you know, bench press is way, way way more likely to hurt you than a kettlebell clean and press way more likely same thing with a barbell deadlift you're way more likely to mess up a barbell deadlift than you are to mess up a clean and press so i i think it can be could be the only strength exercise you did you just you'd get really good at it um but the ranges of motion are much more natural like i believe What is the strategy for peaking for competition? Um, hmm, good question. Uh, that depends on the competition. Uh, for the most part, when we deal with movies, when we're going to do peaking, our peaking is usually for shirtless scenes, which is not really competition. Um, the goal is to look good, so we do all of our fundamental training as much as possible. And then when we're going to prep for a movie scene, if there's a shirtless scene... A, we try and figure out when the hell it's going to be, and that date can move around, which will really, really mess with your peaking, really mess with your peaking, but that's a question for production, always. Um, you know, in those last two weeks, you try to cut out all the stuff that doesn't need to be there in your diet, cut all the sugar out of your coffee, you stop having the awesome English tea with milk and sugar in it, and you go back to drinking just black tea, you cut out all the... Ba the carbs and you start just eating massive amounts of vegetables, fish and chicken and steak in order to just get your body into that. You want to kind of shock it at the end with a, um, 
nutritional change. So normally you eat like a normal athlete and then you, when you're going to be peaking for movies anyway, then you get rid of everything. People get a little bit more testy during that time emotionally because of the change in diet. Um, if you were peaking for say a BJJ competition, then you would do all of your training and you would run probably like a four day wave of training of no intensity, low intensity, medium intensity, high intensity. And you would set that up for weeks ahead of time. And you would set that up so that your competition falls on a medium day. The day before is low training. The day before that is no training, just recovery. But I don't like the idea. I stole this from Steve Maxwell years ago that you don't want to take two days off before your competition because then that first day, the competition day, you're getting back into moving. So what you like to do is have a day before be really light movement, the day before that be full rest and have that competition day fall on a medium day on your cycle so that you can then accelerate really hard into hard training. But your body's prepared for a medium day there, but it's had rest ahead of time. So usually you start, you pick your date for the competition, you start medium day, and then you backtrack your training from there. That's one way to do it. That's a four-day wave. There's also a three, three plus one wave, which is kind of how I set up most normal training in our nerd math programming videos. Um, but yeah, so, well, that's an interesting, that's, that's an answer to that question. Uh, Oak Leaf. He has done barbell, sandbag, kettlebell work primarily. What benefits would be added from working mace and clubs provide that you can't get with sandbag, barbell, or kettlebell? Uh, mimicking throwing patterns, 100%. Barbell is brute strength. Sandbag is brute strength. Kettlebell is a little bit more refined brute strength, I would say. Sandbag and kettlebell, you can get a lot of complexity out of your movements. But for the most part, you're not replicating any of your throwing patterns. So mace and club would put back in the most human thing that you can be doing, which is throwing stuff. You're not throwing things specifically, but you are mimicking all the muscle chains of throwing. So people who barbell might throw really well if they learn to throw very well in their youth. But if you take an untrained individual and train him for five years in barbell, his throwing pattern didn't get any better. Um, if you take somebody and they were to do barbell and clubs, then they would have all the brute strength of barbell and then two to three days a week of clubs would train all the odd angles and would fill in a lot of weird positions. All those weird positions are all the ones you're going to run into in throwing sports and in martial arts. I mean, I couldn't emphasize enough how good mace and clubs are for people who are doing martial arts. Mace is really like almost a direct movement mimic pattern and clubs are really like proto pattern proto movement patterns uh so but they would add all of your striking your blocking and all those other things would become vastly stronger by doing mace and club for our single arm heavy club reps times volume would you recommend the same nerd math that you use for kettlebells uh, something completely different. Yeah, we do not start with 10 sets of 10 reps, EMOM. That is way, way, way too high. If you can already do 10 reps, then you are already advanced at that weight. You're really starting at three to five. Whoa, something just fell down in the studio. Okay, uh, three to five reps for a uh, single arm heavy club. Three to five is where you start, and you build up towards 10 reps. And then you tend to jump program. Only when you're really advanced do you go above 10 reps for your heavy clubs um, for single arm stuff. For two hand stuff, it's totally different. It's time on retention protocols and you could, you know, top 30 reps. But that is when you're starting with really light weights and you can build it up so that you're not jacking yourself to death. If you tried to start with a 45 and do time under tension, you would just break yourself and it wouldn't do you any good at all and you'd be more hurt. You really, even for men, we started our time under tension with 15 pounds. A uh, question from Zen Walker. Is it possible to improve shoulder mobility and squat after a lot of years of doing, of not doing mobility exercises? Yes, 100%. Yes. 
everybody should be able to squat all the way down to the bottom, to the ground. You should be able to squat like a newborn child or somebody who's learning to walk, a one-year-old, all your life. Uh, if you've lost that, you can regain it. Um, I've regained most of mine, and I've had three major knee surgeries. If I can do it, then you can probably do it. You just have to start focusing on your mobility training every day, and you have to start putting back full range of motion stuff into your program. Um, and you can drastically improve shoulder mobility by just learning the fundamentals of mace and uh, heavy club, 100%. I mean, if I can get a 78-year-old to squat full depth and have uh, repair shoulder range of motion, then you can definitely do it if you're not 78. <laughs> uh, here we go. Good question. William Harnim. Uh, any top exercises for somebody that is 100 pounds overweight? Kettlebell, box deadlifts. And presses, 100%. 100%. You're not going to be getting any deck squats in, but box, elevated box squats in a goblet format, 100%. Uh, deadlifts, 100%. And you work your deadlifts in volume cycles until you get to the point where you can do swings. If you're 100 pounds overweight, you might not be able to do swings yet. That does not mean you can't train. So you're going to focus on your deadlift, your box squats, and your standing press, 100%. Um, I would not have you do Turkish get-ups. You won't be able to do them because you are essentially have a 100-pound sandbag on your body. Um, I, would have you, I would have you start with the deadlift, the squat, and the press because I can make those weights really light. I can make them 12K. And we can then start adding volume cycles over and over and over again, and we can build up a little bit more each time. This time we're going to add halos and then we'll add around the world and we'll start getting you moving with really light weights you're going to be using light weights for the most part in the beginning because your body is you're carrying a sandbag around with you all the time so if i can just get you in the right position and load you correctly the kettlebells will help put you in the right position and then we can start stacking up enough core strength muscle in order to start doing more advanced things but think deadlift elevated box squat and a goblet grip or front grip, if you can get to it, and standing overhead presses. 100%, that's where you're going to start. And you can probably start doing single club work as well because single club work has you rotate around your vertical axis. And if you have a bit of a belly, you can rotate and miss the belly entirely. And you will be getting stronger at the position that you want to get good at, which is standing up. 100%. 100%. Uh, for jujitsu, should you go for double kettlebells or single kettlebell training? Um, I would definitely do single kettlebell training first. You can rack up single kettlebell training for at least a year. Double kettlebell training would be much more advanced, but single kettlebell for the most part. I mean, jujitsu is all, all asymmetrical, all the time, all the time which means you want to have as much of your training be asymmetrical as possible, as much as possible. So I would do single kettlebell training and do single kettlebell shin box work a lot, a lot. That is jujitsu training 100%. How many days a week can you do kettlebell swings? I don't know, six, probably six, but you'd have to vary your weight uh, you'd have to vary your weight quite a bit so that you would have a light an intermediate and a heavy weight and you would cycle and you would do different numbers on different days. You would essentially be running three separate volume programs um, for your swings with three different weights in order to keep the load varied up and down. You'd get super good at swings, but you have to have kettle. You have to have at least two kettlebells to do that. You'd really want three and you're running the lightweight is the high rep. The intermediate weight is the intermediate rep, and the heavy weight is the lowest rep count. Will I be releasing a program package? Yes. The goal is to have uh, at least seven out 
seven programs out by the end of October, 100%. Um, so I think I'm actually going to start now with a subscription plan for just people to track along with uh, some, some movie training that we're doing. And then once I get some better technical support, uh, the other programs are coming out. I'm trying to finish up a Turkish Get Up Mastery program this week, and I'm doing a test edit tonight. So we'll see how that goes. If I can figure out how to do it, then it'll be out next week. If not, I'll have to get more technical support. Uh, here's somebody. Hello, X. They've been learning cleans, and they're having shooting pains in their arms. Lighter weights, but obviously they overdid it. Any idea where they're screwing up? Yeah, it's heavier weights, and you're probably not straightening out your elbow at the bottom. You probably have a minor amount of flexion in your elbow at the heaviest point, which is when the weight is at the bottom. You have to get your arm all the way straight. I prefer the thumb back method because it's the least likely to jack your elbows up. But you probably should go see uh, a body worker and have them work on your WADA 3, which is where those cool muscles when you flex your arm are in your upper forearm where they meet your elbow. You probably mess something up in there. Uh, and it's just too tight. And you're beating the crap out of it. And it's causing you more and more problems. Uh, yeah. Uh, what kind of engineer was I? Somebody is studying mechatronics engineering. Um, uh, I was a, studied biochemical engineering because uh, I always wanted to make dinosaurs because I read Jurassic Park when I was in the fifth grade. And I was really under the impression that by the time I got to school that we'd be able to make dinosaurs and I'd be right in there. Uh, but that was not actually accurate. You know, we were still at Dolly the Sheep level when I was in school. Um, and I did a bunch of research science, three years in a lab, uh, you know, just as an undergraduate, but working in a lab, you know, five days a week, uh, you know, working on peer reviewed projects with uh, doctoral students. I did that. It was super interesting, but I really wanted dinosaurs, man. I really wanted to make dinosaurs or bring back woolly mammoths or something, and I just didn't get to do that. So I made a jump to something that got me out of a basement lab with a giant, you know, uh, magnet in it that you couldn't be, you could only stay in one little corner of the lab or get ripped out of the room or something. Uh, and I would love to go back once we start getting closer to our actually bringing back mammoths. I thought about going back last year, but, you know, training's fun. Training is fun. I made that, yeah, I made that switch to personal training just to get out and see more people. You know, I grew up on a farm in the middle of nowhere with no people. I had horrible social skills. Uh, could speak to horses and dogs pretty well, but not to people. And when I went to school, it wasn't making it any better by being locked in a, being locked in a lab for days on end. Um, so I got into training just because I wanted to be out there in the world and do stuff and see things and you know, 20 years of research science, you tend to stay in the same room. Uh, I probably should have just been an archaeologist. That would have been way more fun. Am I actively taking on new clients? Sure. Somebody call me. Give me money. Uh, do I have any videos or suggestions on how to heal tennis elbow starting from bad form pull-ups? Um, it would be kind of most of my channel. You're going to have to drop weight severely, and it really depends on how bad your tennis elbow is. If you've really jacked up your elbow, then you're probably going to have to go to therapy. I've seen a lot of people really, really mess up their elbows, and then they try to get back to normal weights. You're going to have to go below what we consider to be normal weights and let that thing rebuild over time. Uh, yeah, tennis elbow is a real son of a bitch. And without seeing it, I couldn't make really, really good recommendations. But I would highly suggest you go to therapy because that tennis elbow tends not to really fix on its own all that well. You're going to have to do a lot of joint mobility, super light club work, and really just be on it. You're going to have to do your volume cycle math super slow. And you probably have to do your club programs and everything at twice the rate or double it should take twice as long for you to do those programs because you're going to have a lot more recovery 
Can you build big arms and chest using club bells? Yeah. Uh, for the most part, your chest is a supporting muscle group. Um, you're not going to build an Arnold level chest doing club bells. You would have to do a club bell program and then chase it with, you know, an inclined bench press program uh, if you really wanted to. But if there's something better for the overall athletic development of arms, then I don't know what it is. I mean, clubs and mace are all arms all the time. And clubs are even more arm than mace is. Uh, I, my arms aren't huge right now because, you know, I'm only using really light weights right now. But if you jack up that club to a 60-pound club, you will have some serious beast monster arms. And then if you were to chase that then with a chest program, then it would be very, very, very effective. Uh, I don't like to do a lot of bench press, so I would chase it with like a chest-based body flow program. And that would give you a good athletic developed chest and super developed athletic arms. But you're not going to get the Arnold hard peak with uh, these movements unless you're one of those guys who has a short upper arm bone. There are some guys who have that short upper arm bone and they have that short connection point with their bicep. I know a guy who does clubs and he's got that short connection point and his arms are just freaking crazy huge, crazy huge. How do I train a client who completely lacks squat mobility but can, who can perform all other kettlebell club movements with good form to progress? I fix their squat mobility. That's how I do it. Uh, I do the elevated deck squat, and I do a hip series every day. A hip series every day that people come in, it would be a grasshopper, windshield wiper, windshield wiper rotation to elbow, windshield wiper to arm thread, four count. That's a five minute series. It's somebody who lacks squat ability should do every day. And you can fix squat depth in no time. Humans are meant to squat all the way down. We're not meant to squat to 90 degrees. I don't know where people keep getting this idea. It's just because we live in the Western world that people think that you can't squat below chair height, but nowhere else in the world do they believe that. There's no hunter gatherer society who just can't squat. You know, there's it's just crazy. And then you start working uh, elevated deck squats and elevated goblet squats, and you can solve that problem in no time. It's, that's, that's the easiest problem to solve. Squat mobility is by far the easiest problem to solve. The other problems, there are a lot of other problems that it can be, but squat, squat depth is not a problem that's hard to solve. Can we do a video or a program for building big arms and chest using club bells? Yes, it's already written. I'm trying to get it to you. I just have to get some editing help. Uh, hey, trader for life, 93 kilograms, five foot, 11 inches, BMI 27, skinny fat, lots of fat around the thighs, glutes, and love handles. What workouts should you do? All of the ones that I'm telling you to do. <laughs> Kettlebells, clubs, and mace will solve those problems very, very, very quickly. Very, very quickly. Uh, here's a question from Ben O'Leary. Uh, hi, Mark. Recently heard a clip of Pavel saying that a low number of reps per set and long rest times between sets are most effective for strength training. What are your thoughts on this? I think he's absolutely right. Um, for the most part, what I'm not doing is pure strength training. I believe what Pavel is talking about there, and I believe you're referencing the Joe Rogan podcast when you're talking about this, um, training for pure strength. Uh, yes, that is absolutely correct. You know, three to five minute break periods. Almost nobody I train is training for pure absolute strength. Most of the people that I'm training are training for strength endurance or complexity of movement. Um, it's really good. So think about this. I train actors for movies. In movies, there are fight scenes. Absolute strength helps in fight scenes, but what helps more is an ability to move for the amount of time the fight scene lasts. If you have a really not well-trained individual, then you're going to get four or five moves before you have to do an edit and do something like that. But even those four or five moves are going to skyrocket most people's heart rate because 
you're in front of a camera, people are nervous, there's 200 people watching, it's all on a time limit. We want to train people for more endurance type of highly complex movement than what uh, Pavel is talking about, which is absolute strength. If you are a professional athlete and you have a section of your training where you're training for absolute strength, then that is a great recommendation. If you're a professional athlete, you also have eight hours a day to train, which allows you to have a lot more time in your day. Most people don't need pure strength. What most people need is intermediate strength endurance. If I train for pure strength and I can do a 500-pound deadlift, I used to have a job where I carried bales of shingles up onto a roof all day. Uh, What, three shingles per square? And there could be, you know, 40 square shingles I have to go up, which would be what, 120 bales that are 75 to 90 pounds, that is a strength endurance activity. That means I have to go up and down a ladder. I have to pick that thing up, get it on my shoulder, walk across uneven ground, go up a ladder, and then walk up a roof of varying pitch, and then stack those things on top of the roof. A 400-pound deadlift helps, but what helps a lot more is intermediate weight with cross-stabilization in it. So... Absolute strength is good, but most people don't train for absolute strength unless they are a professional athlete and they have a lot of time to recover in between. Uh, I hope that answered your question. If Pavel says something, just go ahead and assume he's right. That guy knows more about training than any of us are going to forget. Movie that had the best sword fighting, in your opinion, and the worst. Best sword fighting, The Duelist, 1977? 1978, I think it's The Duelist. There are four fight scenes, sword fights in that movie that are just, well, highly regarded as the greatest fight scenes ever in film. Uh, Fun fight scenes that I really like, I gotta say, Pirates of the Caribbean. Great sword fights in that. Absolutely super fun, awesome sword fights in that. Worst sword fighting in movies. That's hard. There's a lot of truly terrible sword fights in movies. (laughs) Uh, you'd have to give me a range or like a series of years that you wanted to isolate that down to. Um, but my favorite is the duelist. And I like going back and watching old Errol Flynn sword fighting movies. Cause there's a lot of cool stuff that they did back in those, um, you know, uh, Highlander, the movies don't have great sword fights in them, but they're, I believe they're going to remake Highlander, which should have absolutely amazing sword fights. If the team that's in charge of that actually gets the chance to do it. Um, Highlander, the TV show, the latter seasons had absolutely excellent sword fights in them that are quickly shot, but highly complex. And they cover a lot of different sword fights in there. Um, I really loved the Highlander show in the nineties. I mean, we all did, right? The first couple of seasons don't have great sword fights, but I think beyond like season four or five, they get incredibly good for being shot very fast and very simply. Uh, but other than that, the Pirates of the Caribbean sword fights. I went back and watched the Pirates of the Caribbean here on quarantine. There are some truly good sword fights in there. Uh, Sam Knuth. I'm trying to get the, your organization to buy my Tetris style of programming and kettlebells to build predictable results for new clients. Any tips? Um, yeah, uh, just do the math. Uh, if you want to give me a call or send me an email, Sam, uh, Hey guys, we just got this thing back up finally. Sorry. Uh, uh, but I think we're going to continue to have some technical trouble with it. So we are going to just shut this one down and come back tomorrow after I figure out what exactly this problem is. Um, so sorry for the technical problems, but We are going to figure this thing out and get back to it uh, tomorrow. And we're going to do about the same time tomorrow. I'll do an announcement on Instagram, and we will also put up an announcement on the community page. Um, I will try to get that announcement up uh, later in the day today. So if everybody checks back tomorrow morning, you should see the time announcement there. Um, Everybody have a good day. Sorry for the technical trouble. We'll get back to all these questions tomorrow. Everybody get back on and give me tons of questions. we got tons of answers. Have fun, guys.